uh, sorry, University of Chicago, and also he's a director of Fermilab, Astrophysics Center of the uh, Astrophysics Center. Of, not, uh, not anymore. That's an old, that's old news. Okay. Not their website. <laughs> needs to be changed. But nevertheless, he was the director. And um, um, so for, uh, first, it's really our great pleasure because he's um, in 2007, he got the Gruber Award. And in 2011, he got the Breakthrough Award for cosmology, especially for uh, supernovae data. And his uh, co very close collaborators got the Nobel Prize. We all aware of it. So it's really a great pleasure for uh, having him uh, with us. Um, usually in this forum, we talk about uh, testing quantum gravity in, uh, you know, in a miniature version in small scales. But today we are looking forward to him to tell us uh, how to look for quantum signatures of quantum gravity in the sky. So the floor is all yours, Craig. Thanks. Yeah, I really want to talk about all scales and especially the sky. That's what I'm most interested in now. But um, yeah, so these, uh, and what I'm going to talk about, you can follow up in these papers here if you want. Um, so I, I want to start off with some very general, very, very broad general um, ideas about this, this notion of coherence, uh, quantum coherence, macroscopic quantum coherence, and how it relates to gravity. Um, and of course, this, is, this has been a fascinating issue um, ever since the 1930s. It's kind of interesting how long it took people to, I mean, it's 10 years after quantum mechanics was invented, and um, EPR did their if, you know, famous thought experiment, and Schrodinger did this the famous cat paper. And you know, so this is what everybody thinks of when they think about a macroscopic coherence entangled state, right? And so I don't have to tell you what the system is. Um, but the, I, I just show this here because, I mean, this is really the, the essence of the, of the situation. You can have, on large scales, quantum mechanics predicts that you get superpositions, you know, two things, two different states superposed with each other. Superposition is the characteristic thing about quantum mechanics and entanglement is about superposition with subsystems. And it's entirely non-classical. So that actually is, it's actually easier to talk about that um, in a less amusing way. But to actually talk about the EPR system, um, right? So this is a system where, the einstein podolsky rosen system, where you actually have a, you have a, a positronium atom, an electron and a positron, in a, a, a quasi-stable state. You wait a while and it, they annihilate and they send off gammas in opposite directions. And that is, um, since you start off with an atom, positronium in an S-wave state, um, it's got a spherical, spherically symmetric wave function and so are the products, the spherically symmetric wave function. But when the decay happens, the, um, that, the state that you get is a superposition Usually people talk about, um, can you see my pointer on the screen if I do that? Yeah, you, usually people talk about, you know, measuring, this is what EPR talked about, measuring polarizations, for example. You can measure the, you know, up or down polarization of the other one and the, of one of them and the opposite one kind of knows about what you measure, right? It determines how, how the state, how it projects. Um, but you can do the same thing with the, um, with the directions of the particles, so the, the, the direction that they, the axis that they decay on. Um, so if you start off with an S-wave state like this, you'll end up with the, 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 the quantum state after the decay is a superposition that adds up to an S-wave, equally likely axes in all directions. Superposition of directional pairs. Of course, if you detect one, you know where the other one went, so that collapses the wave function, and we use that all the time in medical imaging, you use this for you know, PET scans, you actually implement this. You have a positron and electron annihilate, you know, in a patient's cancer, and the, uh, the gammas go off in opposite directions. You, ident you can identify the pairs by a time projection. You look at the coincidence in time, you have this macroscopically separated state, and you can figure out where they came from originally. Um, so that's a very, it's a non-trivial thing. It's collapse. It's an EPR collapse. It's happening routinely. We use that all the time. Now, the interesting thing, of course, uh, you, know, what, you know, sort of dialing back to the main subject here, is that gravity is part of this. Um, gravity is part of the same quantum system as matter. And, you know, so these particles that are 
these the decay products have gravity and the space-time has the same coherence as the particle wave function. So it also extends indefinitely on light cones um, in a non-local way. So what we often, you know, the, the, the EPR supposed paradox wasn't a paradox because the, there aren't really two separate particles. There's one quantum system that has two particles in it, and that system lives on a light cone originating at the site of the decay. So it, it's all, there's, a, there's no true paradox of, of quantum mechanics. However, it is non-local and the, it's, there's a non-local state on a light cone. So the, the preparation of the measurement, it's not a causal, but it's non-local. The preparation of the measurement happens on causal diamonds. And, and this has been realized for a long time. So back in the 40s, John Wheeler, you know, had one of those characteristic prescient inspirations. And he wrote this down, that in the gravitational theory, we should be able, in principle, to dispense with the concepts of space and time and take as the basis of our description of nature the elementary concepts of world line and light cone. That was in the 1940s. And people are really still trying to do this. They're still trying to implement this idea. Because he's right. I mean, basically, that's right. You should get rid of the concepts of space and time. Replace it with something which is both respects causality, the world line light code construction, and is non-local. That's what gravity has to be made of. So <clears throat> we'll come back to that in a minute, but for, first of all, let's just consider that the system we were just talking about, uh, this is, I like this thought experiment because um, this, this, is, this, is, this is how we talk about the, this is a way to talk about the gravity, the gra gravitational effect of that particle decay. And it's, it's, it's a great system because um, just like that PET scanner, um, you, uh, you prepare the system and measure the system locally, but that you can measure a property of the system, which is non-local and distributed, which means that you can do both quantum mechanics and gravity at the same time. You do a measurement locally and prepare a measurement locally. That's what you do in quantum mechanics. But, um, but you need a non-local measurement to detect a gravitational effect because gravity obeys the equivalence principle and you can't measure gravity locally. So this is, this is, the, this is the setup. You've, you've, you've got a, a world line here, which is where the, our particle decay is and, and the observer in the same world line. And these dotted lines are the outgoing axis of the, the null decay of two particles going up. And then at some radius r, you've got a sphere of clocks. Then the particle decay happens and it creates a gravitational shock wave. And that distorts the clocks. You can calculate what the distortion is. Um, so it, it's a fascinating system, right? Because the before you start um, down here, before the decay happens, it's just a pure, it's just a Schwarzschild metric. There's a, you know, everything away from the center is just classical Schwarzschild metric. Then the decay happens and then there's, then there's a shock wave that goes out, which is a sphere, like the S wave. And outside it's still Schwarzschild, just like you started. Inside it, there's zero curvature. There's no curvature inside. All of the gravity effect is on a discontinuity on this spherical shock. And it's not a, um, in the shock, it's not isotropic because there is an axis attached to the, the, the decay and that in the shock, it depends upon the, so there's a, so that the, um, the particle state, S wave, corresponds to the sphere, but the, the collapse of the direction, there is an actual, in the classical solution, you have to choose an axis. Okay, so, so what do you do? So you do the decay, you have a sphere of clocks sort of synchronized before, this go before the decay, which is, sorry, the decay is this black line here. Synchronization pulse is this dotted line. And then, um, then the shock hits the clocks and goes through it and creates an instantaneous displacement of time and of velocity. And then you can read the clocks off by a null ray that comes back to the center. And, and what you read is a distortion of the sphere, which is not exactly a quadrupole, but it's mostly a quadrupole. It's like a tide. It's like depending upon the axis, there's a drag. The, 
the particle goes out, it goes in this direction. It tends to accelerate the clocks away, gives it a shock outwards. And so why do I go through all this elaborate thing? Because it's because the gravity effect of this thing is a, is a quantum superposition and it has a macroscopic pattern. It's organized in a quadrupolar matter on the scale R, much bigger than the scale of the particle, whatever you start it with. It doesn't happen in a point, it happens in a quadrupole. And, and it has a universal angular correlation function, which is gravitational. It's a gravitational response. It's also interesting because you get the same response if you don't have just one particle, but many particles. You just get the same distribution, but, but bigger, added in quadrature. So that's interesting, right? That there's a, there's, a co this, there's a coherent gravitational response. And this is just standard physics. I mean, this, you just use the Bohr correspondence principle to, to figure this out. So, so that is um, what, what Wheeler meant, of course, was that um, going, he wanted to go beyond that and talk about gravity itself. And, and that's what people have been working on, you know, for the last 60 years, 70, 80 years almost. The, um, the uh, horizons of black holes and things like that, causal diamonds. Nowadays, people are thinking those whole things are quantum objects. And Tuft has been thinking about this a lot lately in, in the context of black hole horizons and saying, why well, we should think about a black hole like an atom, when you do a, a non-relativistic atom interaction, you never think about the, the spatial distribution of stuff. You think about the whole atom as a quantum system interacting coherently with the quantum state of, a, of an in and out particle. So that's when people do coherent scattering, that's what they do. And so the, so the idea is that a black hole is the same way. It's, there's one, you know, spatially, you think classically a black hole horizon or a causal diamond as being a large thing with an extended classical object, but in, in the quantum mechanical state, it's one thing. So that if you if you touch, if you interact with, it doesn't mean anything to interact with just one point on the black hole. You interact with the whole black hole, the non-local extended object, which is which is not the classical view, right? That's very, it's in essence quantum mechanical. That's what I mean by coherent quantum gravity. And and, and there's there's a natural a whole in other whole literature lines of thought about this sometimes called entropic emergent or, or holographic gravity and, um, and again you can track down the literature starting with this paper by Jacobson if you want others by Verlinde and uh, people like that um, and the idea there is you know it isn't really um, it's not it's well these aren't quantum models they are um, thermodynamic models but but I mean but they do assume that the model is that um, space-time is, is like a fluid and you can derive the field equation statistically, like an equation of state. Um, and if that's right, then the, the elements of this are, as Wheeler said, the macroscopic holographic causal diamonds. They're causal structures, not, not atoms, right? They're not particles. They're not waves either. They're causal structures. There's another, another line of thought and again, this, these are just examples of um, kind of what's going on. There's a proposed solution to the black hole information paradox, which I like a lot, which again, in its essence, is um, based on non-local quantum entanglement. So macroscopic coherence of quantum gravity. Here they call, they call them entanglement wedges, which is a nice name for it instead of, instead of coherent causal diamonds. But it's the same idea. And, and you know, so you, again, I'm not I'm not going to go to the details of how this works, but the um, it does. I mean, if you basically the idea is that if you look at black hole entropy the right way, with the right amount of fine graining, if you don't coarse grain it too much, but you you, you know you, you don't try to do too much or too little locality, um, then you can get the you avoid the, the information paradoxes. You you can track down exactly in what way the information is, is localized, which is only on causal diamonds. It's not localized, literally locally, as we usually mean it. But of course, when we, when we talk about quantum gravity, everybody wants to talk about the Planck scale, which is, of course, in May is incredibly local, right? It's this tiny, tiny scale. 
And in the, in the example I just gave, the um, the shock wave, the gravitational shock wave, the, the the relevant the Planck scale is relevant to the width of the shock. That that solution becomes inconsistent if you try to go closer than this distance to that shock wave that goes up. But that's a null structure, right? It's a distance in proper time away from the null structure. But that 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 example does show us that in spite of stuff. The, the quantum system being at the Planck scale, the coherence is not confined to the Planck scale. So you shouldn't think about it like this, this you know, the famous quantum foam of uncorrelated, you know, roiling, you know, virtual particles coming and going just to the Planck scale, but it, they're really delocalized objects on light cones, non-locally. And if that's true, if that's how it works, that's what might make the Planck scale effects detectable. So that, and there, again, there's a, a literature about this. I'm not going to go into um, recent papers by Verlinda and Zurek and, um, and you guys actually. Um, you're talking about, you know, that how coherence matters if you're trying to do an experiment. The, the simplest way to, to look at this is to just think about what um, uh, Braginsky, Carlton Caves years ago called, 40 years ago called standard quantum uncertainty. So this is an expression, it's just the Heisenberg uncertainty. And the thing that's a little surprising here is that, so this is now the uncertainty for the position of a mass for a, a real measurement over an extended period of time, tau. And it gets bigger the longer the duration of the measurement is. And it does get smaller with, as you increase mass, as a quantum uncertainty should, but it is much larger than the Broglie length for a mass. If, if you have a time scale much bigger than the de Broglie time for a particle. And, 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 that, and that is, you could think about it as a diffraction, if you think about particles as wave functions. Um, and this is the, you know, it's the uncertainty that enters into you know, LIGO and other systems like that. It's also, if you, if you think about the system that we had before, the, the clock sphere of the decay, if you put in as many plague mass particles as you can into a causal diamond without making a black hole, this is what you, this is what you get for the gravitational clock distortion, the gravitational shocks give you the same number. So that's the effect that could, if that is the uncertainty and the, the absolute of fluctuations, that's, a, that's what you could detect in interferometers. Now, I'm really not gonna talk about the Fermi lab holometer very much. And if you wanna know about this kind of thing, you should get Hartman to give a talk because he's the one who's really knows about this, thinking about it at the moment. But th this is just an example of the, the experiment that we, we did, we finished at Fermi lab. And you know, so what, what we did is we had a, to, to measure this effect, to measure coherent causal diamonds, as we thought, you'd have two Michelson interferometers. Each one of them is a LIGO-like, so I'm sorry, come back to that. Each one of them is a LIGO-like thing. Um, you know, there's, there's a beam splitter, laser comes in and then there's long 40 meter arms. And then you um, correlate the outputs very quickly you have a, a, do a, a cross correlate, you correlate the two signals that come out so that if there's an incommon coherent perturbation of the signals on that 40 meter scale, uh, you would see it at, at the, in the correlated signal. And so that's why it's important to have a, a high bandwidth. This is why you can't do it with LIGO. It doesn't have the right experimental parameters to do this measurement. If you rebuilt LIGO, refitted it, you could do it with the interferometers, of course. Um, and, and, and we were able to, um, with many hours of integration, um, integrate down to get a Planck time precision in what, what you call the strain spectral density. So the, you know, the, there's a, a quantity with the dimensions of time, inverse Hertz. It's the square power spectral density of displacement here in terms of strain. So this is the data from that first experiment. Um, and it, it really, the, the main takeaway here is the, the, you know, the left-hand plot. Look at the numbers. These have the dimensions of time. And the times are on the Planck scale. So again, I, I don't want to, you guys know about the experiment. I'm not going to go into the, but the point was that we were able to measure and constrain a, Planck scale model and, and rule it out with an experiment like this. So if you did have 
fluctuations of a certain shape of the amplitude that I was just talking about, we would have seen them. And we roll out at fluctuations like that with a particular, with, you know, particular symmetry, the quadrupolar mode. Um, it, it, it way better than, way, much smaller than the Planck time, a few percent of the Planck time. Now, so we didn't see anything. That was a null result. And um, we thought that what maybe one reason, maybe the reason was that we were just measuring the wrong thing. And so we, we, we modified this that machine um, by bending the one arm of each interferometer. Because the first machine would not have been sensitive to rotations or transverse displacements. In other words, if, if you take this, this end mirror and you wiggle it this way, it has no effect on the signal. But if you bend the arm like this and you wiggle the arm this way relative to the beam splitter where the measurements are made, this would, it would enter the signal of this experiment. And we haven't, we haven't published the results of this, but I can, I can tell you it's also a null result. And it's a similar sensitivity to the first one. So again, if, if we didn't say anything, it's because if, if there's an effect of that order, it's because of a symmetry that we didn't see. And Hartmut's, that's, Hartmut's building the successor for this and he's doing the R&D. He had his background up in his lab, which is, you know, he's working on the, how to do this better at a smaller scale and explore less symmetric, you know, wider range of possible perturbations. So I'm not going to talk about that because I want to, I want to spend the rest of my time talking about what I'm thinking about now, which is back to cosmology. And th th this is interesting uh, because it's, it's another application of coherent quantum gravity, um, which, um, well, which is, it's an old idea, well, it, it's an old idea with a new application. So we, we have this um, it, signal, it's, this isn't noise, this is, signal. This is a, the famous map of the sky by the Planck satellite with the galaxy removed. And, uh, you know, and the, the, and it looks like noise, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a signal. This is uh, uh, the anisotropy and the temperature of the sky, we think was imprinted by a quantum system during inflation. And not only that, but th this, is, this is not a fluctuation, it's a frozen fluctuation. It's an intact image of a coherent quantum state of what the, the system was doing, which is a very rare and difficult thing to create in the laboratory. You never see images as good as this of coherent states in the laboratory. You, there are some images of coherent condensates, but they're not as rich and detailed as high signal noises. Um, and th this contains information about the coherent quantum state and the inflationary horizon. So we, we should, Transplant the ideas we were just talking about to the inflationary context. So let's talk about that. So it, it, it's it's kind of nice because the in, inflation, if you if you if you go to a conformal time and conformal space coordinates, it has just the same causal structure as as flat space time. You just have different coordinates, really, the co-moving coordinates. So on the left side here is the causal diagram for standard inflationary cosmology, where so we might be the, on this world line, this is us. This, this surface here, the spatial hypersurface, is the end of inflation. And you can't see it here because it's all been taken out of the conformal coordinates. So before then, everything is exponentially expanding away. And, and the way the fluctuations are laid down is that um, during, during inflation, um, there's this quantum region at the beginning where there, there are, there are uh, field vacuum waves. Um, zero point oscillations fields. When the wavelength of the wave becomes coupled with the horizon, which happens here, I haven't drawn the wave, but it would be of this wavelength. Um, they freeze in. They say freeze in, it, it um, adiabatically stops oscillating. It becomes part of the metric. Um, and, and when it becomes part of the metric, it becomes a classical curvature perturbation. And we, that's what we see when we look at the microwave background, which is here. You know, if, if we have coherent quantum gravity, um, the right way to do this is like a black hole horizon. And you shouldn't freeze the fluctuations here, which after all is way outside the causal diamond. You should freeze everything on the horizon, like in a black hole or, you know, in an experiment. 
our horizon, our inflationary horizon is this light cone. So this is an incoming null wave, which actually during slow roll inflation has an almost constant radius. It's kind of like a black hole horizon. It's kind of stuck um, in physical units at the her inflationary horizon. So all of these world lines, you know, are, do you think about them as like spheres, which go through this horizon and they get frozen in? So it, it's a different, it's a different quantum system really to the standard inflationary view. It freezes in in a different way. The interesting thing is that it gives you very much the same answer for the standard things. I'll come back to that in the, um, the way inflation works. So let's just suppose that um, that's how quantum inflation works. That there's there's a coherent null surface. Perturbations form coherently on that horizon. If that's right, then it, then it imprints angular correlations, just like the quadrupolar perturbation of our decaying particle that we started with. Not necessarily quadrupolar because it's a different system, but they have large scale angular correlations. Now, everybody's seen this famous plot. When we talk about inflation, inflationary perturbations, this is what you're used to seeing. This is the angular spectrum. Uh, or the, the powers, the angular power spectrum of the fluctuations. And um, all, what your the standard cosmology, which is, you know, amazing in many ways, predicts this red curve with just, uh, you know, five or six parameters and agrees with the data amazingly well and it fits to, you know, percent level accuracy. The thing you don't usually hear about is everything on the left side of this plot, these low L modes. And you can, and there's a lot, there's reasons for that. Um, first of all, it doesn't agree very well, <laughs> but people don't worry about the fact that it doesn't agree very well because actually the error bars are really big. And the error bars here are not measurement errors, they're theory errors. They're what people call cosmic variance. The theory doesn't actually predict things very accurately on those, at those small angular wave numbers. Um, so th this is, this is a, the same thing, but it's, now focusing more at low L, and you can you can now you see what the, the issue is. So that the theory actually just predicts an expectation. It doesn't predict a realization. It predicts an expectation and a variance. At high L, you can average over all these points, which is what's done in the previous plot. At very high L, you can get the error bar small by averaging over many discrete Ls. But at at, at low at low angular wave number. Um, there's really a lot of, there's a lot of scatter and that's what's expected. It's because you, you have in the standard picture, you have this horizon and there you have waves which wash over it, which are in correlated random phase waves. And the, um, so there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of variance and, and even taking that into account, it doesn't agree very well. Look, for example, this one down here is really low. It's well outside of the one sigma expectation for that. So, um, th so that it isn't really talked about very much, uh, and not worried about very much because, uh, because of cosmic variance. Now, there's another way to view the same data, uh, which is in the angular domain. So, the, the plot I just showed you is this: the power angular power spectrum in terms of L. But you can also correlate the, the two-point angular correlation function, and that's given at the top plot here. And so, this is a different; it's the equivalent information. Yeah, it's the angular correlation function. It's just angles instead of wave numbers. And, and, and so here again, is, here's the data from two satellites, WMAP and Planck. And the standard model prediction, uh, and I'll show some more plots of this in a minute, but you know, it's just, it has its expectation value. And then the gray band shows the range of all this, the different realizations. And actually, it doesn't agree very well, even with the range of realizations, if you look at the angular domain. And this has actually been a problem uh, for ever since the beginning, from the first time that the microwave background was ever measured by the cosmic background explorer, this is you know back in the 90s, so early 90s, um, they, they saw this, this dash curve here. And they noticed right away that was not what they expected to see. What they expected was something like this great thing. But when what they saw was um, very little correlation, almost zero vanishing correlation of large angles, which actually, you know, it's not predicted and it looks like a symmetry that you've ignored, I mean, that you didn't expect. And so, that, like I said, it was known since the 90s, but the, as the data got better, that result is still there in WMAP. Here's the WMAP measurement and here's the Planck measurement. 
of the same thing. Um, and they, uh, they'll come back to the agreements and disagreements between the data, but the main result is the same. There's very little correlation of large angles, which is a surprising thing. And that, that really um, isn't what you expect, right? If, if in, in the standard cosmology, this, this is just, uh, I think this is 50 random realizations. The expected thing is this black curve, the typical, and the actual sky should be one of these colored curves. And almost none of them look like what you see. Almost none of them, which, what you see is something that hugs zero out here at large angles. Now, it's interesting because if you um, think about what a holographic model might do, um, and I come back to some details on this in a minute, um, if it's holographic, what that should mean is that there should be a universal two-dimensional correlation function because it's a two-dimensional power spectrum. It's holographic. It's not three dimensional. The standard picture is three-dimensional a universal three-dimensional power spectrum, which is why you get this scatter in the two-dimensional projection. But on a sphere, a holographic horizon should have a universal two-dimensional power spectrum. So what you would expect would be a model, you should be able to construct a model if you understood quantum gravity, which would look something like this. This is, the model, this is an actual model of a, the orange curve. And you should be able to just fit the data. You know, you shouldn't have any scatter. You should just, at large angles. So it's a very different, attitude towards the large angle data, then the usual attitude now is we just won't worry about it because there's this cosmic variance and the theory doesn't predict anything anyway. So we'll concentrate on what we understand with the small angles. But you might be missing the, a really key clue here about holography. Okay, so why hasn't that been studied more? Well, the main reason I would say is that there's this huge measurement challenge in is in measuring large angle precision, large angle correlations. And that is that we live in this galaxy. If you actually look at the sky, the, the actual image of the sky with Planck is, is more like this thing on the upper left. You could take out the dipole, that's easy. That's from our peculiar motion. But you're still left with the galaxy, which is a huge bright structure. I mean, if you, before you subtract the galaxy, you can only see the primordial fluctuations clearly at the galactic poles. Out here, you see these little patches. That's the primordial map here and here. In, in the main part of the sky, it's a mess. The, the satellite teams did an amazing job of removing that. You, in, by, in fact, the Planck satellite was designed with, had with many frequency bands, W map too, but especially Planck had many frequency bands, high frequency bands, to take all of that out because its foreground emission does not have a black body spectrum. And so they made maps like the one at the right. This is called Commander. So that's their reconstructed micro background. And that's the famous map that I started showing at the beginning. Um, and it, that is, that looks more like what you expect, statistically uniform. If you look closely though, there is a little trace of a galaxy in the middle. But they haven't got it, it's not completely gone. And that, in fact, they, they did more than one model of the galaxy. And if you smooth it and take the difference between their different models of the galaxy, you get this thing at the lower left, which you can still see the galaxy. It isn't completely gone. And so that if you're really trying to do high precision work, that's the difficulty. There's a limit to how well you can do this. However, um, we shouldn't give up. Um, this is the same thing in an orthographic projection and smooth. So if you look at the large angles, the idea is that these large angle, th these are just primordial. These are the maps of the horizon on that sphere pure gravity, really pure quantum gravity, but, um, but it's contaminated. This is, it's not as bad as it looks because I blew this up. The scale is higher contrast than this, but buried in this, these are two maps. There's, there's contamination still. So that's the limit to the measurement. Nevertheless, um, we decided to look at it anyway. And um, so this is a paper we did last year with some summer students, Steve Meyer and I. Um, you know, to ask, are there really symmetries in this data? And what's interesting is that um, there are, the map, the different galaxies, the different ways of subtracting the galaxy, they do agree very well with each other at, um, at right angles, at that 
the right angles on the sky, the correlation functions. Uh, the models don't have a contamination, apparently. Not only that, but at that angle, the measured correlation is almost exactly zero. So I, I started off by saying that it's close to zero. It's almost exactly zero. And I find this fascinating. So, so here are the different maps. And the scale here is plus or minus two and a half here, micro Kelvin squared. Whereas this, this is on the scale of a thousand. So you really have to zero in on this thing. Uh, they really are zero. And, and that to me signals, not, it's not cosmic variance. It doesn't, the standard model is that this just happens by chance. That is, uh, it's just a fluke. Yeah, or in holographic, the holographic interpretation would be no, this is that way, it's zero, you have 90 degrees because of an exact symmetry in the theory, completely different interpretation. So it, 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 you know, so, so back, back to this idea, right? I mean, if you have a holographic model, you get an orange curve like this, which could go exactly through zero and be close to zero elsewhere, but not exactly zero compared to this, which is the standard model, this is all over the place. So, I mean, if you, and if you did a, you know, a likelihood comparison, this, the, all of, obviously the holographic model would win this because the likelihood of getting the data in that theory is much higher. And, and, and it, this is at all, all, this goes down to not just very large angles, this goes down, this cosmic variance is true all the way down to a few degrees of angular scale. It's really an order of magnitude of, more than order of magnitude of dynamic range. And it's not just at 90 degrees, you know, it's the same deal at very large angles. The standard predictions are th these bands and the measurements aren't like that. There's a negative correlation, an anti-correlation in opposite directions of the sky, even in fairly small patches, these antipolar correlations. And this is, been also been known, it was noted by the satellite teams in the angular domain, what it, you see this by looking at the, um, the fact that if you go to the odd even alternate, so the odd pair, the even modes, even parity Ls, two, four, six, et cetera, have a lower amplitude than the odd ones. There's two, three, four, five, six, that the even modes are smaller than the odd parity modes, which adds up to this net. In the correlation function. And that extends all the way up to L's of 20 or more. So uh, there's another, there are other anomalies that have been noticed that might be explainable in a holographic picture, like the fact that the quadruple and octopole harmonics are very closely aligned on the sky, which would have no explanation in the standard picture. If something like this is going on, um, you would also expect to see it in three dimensions. And this is something that would be totally weird. It has not been, it hasn't been possible to measure this yet. Um, but um, it's something that you might be able to do in with cosmic surveys in the next decade with, uh, you know, LSST especially, also 21 centimeter, a variety of high volume, high dynamic range, high resolution, high fidelity, good redshift, three-dimensional maps. Basically any sphere of, in the linear regime of galaxies should have the same angular pattern as we see the microwave background. If it's holographic, it should be universal. And for example, the quadrupole moments should all be low if you were able, and that hasn't, it hasn't been possible to measure that property because we haven't had good enough three-dimensional maps, but that is something that we might see coming up in the near future. Right, so um, so I, this is all very intriguing to me and, I, and it's something that we're continuing to study. Okay, so I have about, uh, I don't know what, 15 minutes left. I wanna talk about one more thing. Um, so again, switching gears still in cosmology, another consequence of coherent quantum gravity should be, I mean, it should, it should have an, an accommodation for the cosmological constant. Th th this is the biggest problem, in, according to Steven Weinberg, in not just in cosmology, but in physics, 
Um, and, and it really it is, isn't really explained just by appealing to thermodynamic gravity and I mean, in, in you know Jacobson's theory, the cosmological constant is a constant of integration, an arbitrary parameter. Physically, what we see, right, the, I, I won't bore you with the details because you've heard this story many times, the galaxies today are all flying apart from each other faster and faster with time. We can look at the recent expansion of the universe and see that it's been accelerating over the last you know, octave or so of expansion. And the physics of that is that somehow or other, empty space is gravitationally repulsive. The gravity of the vacuum is negative. That is, it's not, a, it's not, it's not only not understood in standard physics, there's no place in standard physics to find an explanation of it because we don't have, it really is a quantum gravity effect. So, so if, 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 if coherence is a thing in quantum gravity, if that is a property that we need to accommodate, it should have a role in explaining the cosmological constant. So that, that's what I want to talk about in the remaining time. So what is the problem that Steve Weinberg was worried about so much? We, well, this is in a nutshell. So you can measure, you measure the rate of cosmic acceleration. We do that with supernovae and so on. And you can measure it in Planck units, our favorite units. And um, in Planck units, the astronomy measurement has, is a number in, in the rate of acceleration is 10 to the minus 61 in Planck units. And this is also, if you like, Einstein's cosmological constant, the square root of that in Planck units. So the lamb, Einstein's lambda is like the density of the vacuum and it gives you a expansion rate, which is, the, the density is wrong by 122 orders of magnitude and the expansion rate's wrong by 61 orders of magnitude because that you get one if you just applied, if you just assumed that the zero point oscillations of Planck field quantum foam vacuum, it just has standard gravity, you'd get one for this and not 10 to the minus 61. So there's two parts of the problem. The first part of the problem is why is it, why is lambda so small? It's 10 to the minus 61. It's practically zero. The second part of the problem is it's not exactly zero. It's, it's not an exact symmetry. There's some, there's a tiny, non-zero physical value. That's why the discovery of dark energy was so, such a big deal because before then, physicists were kind of comfortable in the notion that there's some unknown symmetry of quantum gravity which makes it exactly zero. Now we have to have a symmetry which makes it not exactly zero, but very, very small. So, so another, another way of putting this is, I mean, in this, this is more of an astronomer's plot. So you apply the scale factor as a function of time in lots of different cosmological models. And the data show up as these points, and here you know here are today. It's very linear nearby. If you look far into the past, what you see is that the expansion was slower. It's been speeding up. Like there's a concaveness to the curve here. It's curving upwards. And um, so on this plot, the, the way to pose the question is: Why is this happening now? Why you know, ten billion years after the Big Bang? Why is only now? This is kicking in. Why didn't it happen back then at the Planck time? And, what, you know, and, and on this scale, you'd say, well, why this scale? Why is it very close to zero, but not exactly zero? So I just want to, I just have a few ideas about how this might happen. I don't have quantum gravity theory, but in coherent quantum gravity, you might be able to make this work because we know the virtual particles are real. The thing that we need to explain is why their gravity is almost zero. And we can go back to a shock wave like we started with, with, with a decay. In this case, consider a planar shock wave that if, if you have a particle moving along a null trajectory like this, it creates a dis shock wave, a displacement of this magnitude in the null direction, a planar shock. And this again is an old solution, Ekelberg and Sexel in the 1970s and 80s. And a Tuft also has worked on this in the past. Um, so the conjecture would be that in quant coherent quantum gravity, because it's coherent, you can make the coherent, the coherent gravitational displacements of virtual particles exactly cancel if you have non-interacting virtual particles. If you just have cancellations of these shocks, you don't get any net gravitational effects. 
which is not obvious if you have the field model. It doesn't happen that way in the field model because there are, you have infinite size. In, our, in the coherent model, it's limited to causal diamonds. And, and so th the way you might do this would be to have a, you know, shocks of counter-propagating particles and you add up outgoing and incoming uh, in a causal diamond and these just linear displacements would just cancel. So for exactly radial momenta in virtual particles, you make them go away. Now, what's, what's interesting though, is if you, um, what if you had non-radial, what if you had pairs of particles which were kind of missing each other like this, particle shock from this and a, and a gravitational shock from this, in between the two, the gravitational shocks do gravitational frame dragging. They, they produce a kind of spin if they go this way, I guess one way I've drawn it here, they can go this way or this way. And if you're in between, you would, you get a, a, a spinning effect, a frame dragging. Those same linear shocks would cause a net outward drag and a net, and a net spin. And this is a higher order effect. So it's a really small effect. Um, so it has, has this order of magnitude goes, and it goes down like the, um, the, the impact parameter squared. Which means that if you have a self-interacting particle, that the virtual affections might produce a non-zero gravitational effect. So this is, this is digging into that a little bit deeper. What would be the coherent quantum gra gravity of self-interacting virtual particles? The mean impulses still cancel for the reason I said earlier, but the mean squared don't. The mean squared impulses, they're, they're positive definite, so they always add. So the mean square gives you a net outward acceleration. It, which you could think of like an excel, a centrifugal acceleration, the jitter back and forth like this will give you a net outward effect. And the magnitude of that is this very weak second order effect. And that was two powers, so twice Planck suppressed of Newton's big G and six powers of the particle scale, right? Two of them from the momentum and one of them from the separation. So, in the standard model, the standard model of particle physics, what would you expect? Well, at high energies, the standard model is asymptotically free. It, it, the particles approximate nearly free massless fields. So you get a nearly zero cosmological constant. You take it to the Planck scale, and because of that symmetry, the coherent gravity shocks go away. But if you, there's an infrared divergence in the standard model, which is that you have in, you have core confinement, you have infrared. In the infrared, the, um, the non-abelian strong interactions, the self-interactions of gluons, uh, give you strong correlations at the QCD scale. And that's the scale that would be giving you the cosmological constant. So you can, you can estimate what this would be. So this is the same figure that I had before, but now I put this blob in here, and the blob is you know, designed to illustrate the virtual fluctuation of a virtual pion pair. And the scale of that is the strong interaction scale. So this is something which has, has coherent spin, so transverse momentum, which you know goes and comes away because it's virtual. But there's a the second order accumulated mean square would give us an amplitude like the ones that I was just, for the gravity effect, the, the estimate we just had, which goes like the six power of the mass. You get this number for it. So I just estimate, you know, if you put in the number, the observed value 10 to the minus 61 for the Planck, for the Hubble, for the cosmic acceleration, the cosmological constant is observed. What do you need for the mass of this blob, this coherent quantum state? 10 to the minus 20 times the Planck scale. That's what you need. That's 100 MeV. That's the Planck scale. That's the mass of the pion, 135 MeV. So I just find this extremely suggestive. And the, the coincidence here is not, I haven't noticed this for the first time. Zeldovich talked about this back in the 60s. It's, it's just numerology. But and, you know, in, 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 if you have coherent quantum gravity, I, this, this is kind of what you expect to be. The, uh, and it gives you a, an absolute value for the cosmological constant, which is usually assumed to be completely unimportant. It's usually assumed to be just, again, just some random thing that it has, you know, just by chance that's what it is. No, you could calculate the value from 
from QCD, some, you know, a very, not me, a clever lattice gauge person could calculate the correct, uh, you know, Wilson loop integral, the correct, correct way to do the averaging of the, the coherent mean square energy flow fluctuations. And you would be able to calculate the, the actual absolute value of the cosmological constant from the QCD that we know. Another way to visualize this it goes back to the early days of string theory. When people first invented strings, they invented it to talk about QCD. And the way you visualize it was this way. You, you have a, a virtual pion is, uh, or just any pion actually, is an excitation, which is a quark any quark pair connected by a gluonic string. And that flux tube, right, that string. Most of the mass in this thing isn't in the quarks, it's in the gluons. That's, you know, like most of the bag is in the gluonic energy. So that, the, the equation of state of this, of a string, of a gluonic string, has an exotic repulsive gravity equation of state. That's what strings have. So that's, a, that's it's kind of another physical way to think about why this might give you a repulsive, repulsive gravity of the vacuum of the virtual pions. So as I say, I, I mean, I think that if, if there are any QCD people listening, let's talk about this, because I, I think that this ought to be a program in, in lattice theory to do this calculation. Um, another side, side remark to make is that um, you could, you know, the, I, wrote, I already wrote down this number, one over, this is one over, the thing I had a few minutes ago. The time scale for cosmic acceleration, how long, you know, the why now, what is now, one over h, one over the Hubble constant, one over h lambda, is 10 to the 61 times the Planck times. That's the acceleration rate. This large number, the ratio of the quark mass to the Planck mass number, 10 to the 61, that's the, this is the same large number that enters into astrophysics. You know, so it is, you know, as I was growing up doing my PhD with Martin Rees, this is our favorite large number. It goes back to Dirac. You know, it's, it's the ratio of the proton mass to the Planck mass. That's why stars last a long time. It's because the Planck mass is 10 to the 20 times bigger than the pion mass, 10 to the 19 80 times bigger than the proton mass. That's why this, the sun has 10 to the 58, the cube of that, that's the, how many protons it has. So it's the same large number that controls astrophysics for a completely different reason, but it does explain why this fundamental reason for the cosmological constant would come up with the same time scale as the astrophysical stuff that controls why we're here now, the time scales of, of so it's, it solves the why now problem in a broad brush way. Okay, so I, my time is up. I'm just gonna finish by um, summary. Let's go down the list because I talked about a lot of things. So the first thing to say is that the gravity should be coherent and causal, I think we just know it should be coherent and causal structures. I, that shouldn't be controversial, because otherwise quantum mechanics can't talk to gravity. And it could make the Planck scale effects measurable. That's a little bit more controversial because we don't know how it works really. The laboratory experiments reach Planck sensitivity. Um, we've shown that and Hartman's gonna make that work better. They already constrain some symmetries, so our null results do that. And this is going to get, now the, the cosmology I talked about is very controversial. Uh, so you, because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't invalidate the triumphs. Anything to do with the power spectrum in standard cosmology is not changed by this. But the idea that the quantum model is fundamentally missing this coherence, that is not standard cosmology. But I would argue that we should take it seriously because we have evidence for it and the symmetries on the largest angular scales. Like, those that deserve to be, to get more attention than they have in the past. And it might even be possible to measure, maybe we're already measuring symmetries of, the, of a universal holographic correlation function, something that was built into the quantum, the quantum gravity that made the fluctuations. Might be on the sky, maybe in 3D we can measure it too. And, and then finally, this idea, it really is just an idea now. I mean, it's not, it's like a back of the envelope idea. But I, again, I think that the value of the cosmological constant is the, would be the holy grail here. Instead of just having it, we'd actually be able to calculate 
a number. I mean, we measure the value of the cosmological constant astrophysically now to a few percent precision. Why not try to get a theory as good as that? That seems like a reasonable goal, and um, if if that's the right kind of explanation. Okay, so I'll um, I'll finish there. We can stop for questions. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much, Greg. So uh, from uh, I'm not hearing. No, there from, you. Uh, um, our audience, is there any question for Craig? Is there any question for Craig? Um, may, maybe I will, I will start maybe with I the will. question. Right. Hi. Um, so you're, you're talking about the uh, coherent uh, quantum gravity. Yeah? So, so of course, um, we know that coherence usually is very difficult to preserve. Like in any environment, you know, destroys coherence. So while the system may be quantum and coherent in a fundamental sense, but you see so if you're talking about, say, a horizon, which is a very large macroscopic thing to be coherent, would that mean that that horizon should not uh, interact with, you know, things around it? And, and how will you ensure that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's the whole question, isn't it? But I mean, if you have a whole causal diamond, you're really talking about the interaction of that with its environment. Right, so like, so we know that, um, like, so a lot of things to say about this. We know that gravity is very stiff. I mean, the Planck scale is very small length. So in that, in the PET scanner, we know that the particles are coherent until you get, until you detect them, right? I mean, so uh, you, know, you can re you really can reconstruct where the decay happened. And so the gravity of that has to be that coherent, you know, it just has to be. So. That part of it isn't controversial. The, the difficult part is to know, yeah, what's the real quantum gravity of it is where the, you know, you have a quantum, you have a, a causal diamond embedded and nested in another one. And in the cosmological system, that's the whole game when you try to calculate those correlation functions. That's that inflationary system. I guess I didn't have a plot of that, but I mean, that is, there's a lot of other, I guess I can go back and show this. You know that um, this one, right? Each of these other world lines has the same causal diamonds, right? And and this is this is this is our causal. This is our horizon. This, for example, is a horizon of this guy. And so they're they're entangled with each other back here, right? And and they're not independent. So actually, the whole in, in the inflationary system it doesn't really become completely classical for everybody until the end of inflation. For any single observer, you could say, oh, it's classical outside my horizon here. But the whole system, which is what we care about, which includes all the entanglement, doesn't, that doesn't happen until the end. So, so yeah, so it, and your question really goes very deeply because it's about the, what's the nature of locality? We have these, um, Incompatible views of locality in quantum mechanics and relativity, and and you know that these are kind of model systems that use tricks to use that we can control from one side or the other. The the, the real thing knows how to entangle the whole causal diamonds with each other. I don't know how to do that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I know I'm unmute you. Is there any other question? Hi, Craig. Um, yeah, I have a somewhat naive, maybe fundamental question, really. Um, a lot of everything that's sort of gone on in these slides here is, is sort of based on this idea of causal diamonds being uh, able to, to exist in a place um, in a sense that they're, they're non-local. Um, I know, obviously, when we had the information paradox in the past, you have complementarity from, from Suskind, and um, he resolved the whole no cloning issue using this idea of having different physics on different causal diamonds and so on, they don't have to be consistent. Obviously, we know in, in 2012, this, this encountered trouble with the firewall paradox and, and, and so on. Um, I was just wondering if there's any sort of fresh motivation to, to sort of trust in this idea of disconnected causal diamonds and, and sort of have them non-local and, and continue that way. Yeah, no, I, I, I guess I don't really know. I mean, the um, there are many 
as you know, so the, the black hole information paradox is a lot of different attitudes towards that. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, a lot of, and I, this is not agreed about how you solve it. I know Bob Wald really thinks the quantum mechanics breaks down. I think Kutuf maybe would think that too. So, so no, I, I don't, I don't know the right solution to that. Um, mm -hmm. I, so I, my attitude has just been to, I don't know, kind of step back and mm -hmm. say, I, we, I don't know. I mean, there's, can we make progress on this issue by stepping back and saying there are, we know there are non-local coherent correlations of some kind. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, that's rather, those are really important issues of principle, right? That I'm not avoiding, I'm avoiding, I'm avoiding those issues, but Instead, it's asking question, what would be the physical observables? That's what that's what my title was. Yes. What would be the physical effects? And and I, I, you know, and try to connect that with data. You know, if we if we see it in the microwave background, I, can you still see my screen? I'm not sure. Yes, you can. Oh, that's great. I can see you as well. Um, yeah. So if we actually see that, I mean, so if we measure this. Mm -hmm. I mean, we measure that. I mean, if we if we have a theory which can predict that, which is something we measure, then I would say we should take seriously the idea that the, oh, yes, there's a real holographic effect that we should measure. Yeah. Thank you. I think there's a question by Animesh as well. Animesh. Ah, yes. Hi, uh, this is Animesh from the University of Warwick. So it's a very interesting talk, but I was a bit unclear as to sort of a couple of things. So can you clarify what is it that you actually ruled out in the first part and what kind of coherent models were you using in the later two parts? Yeah, so we, we had some papers about that. I mean, the, the, so the, roughly speaking, the, the model that we ruled out was a model like the cartoon that I had at the beginning. It was saying that, you know, let's just say that the end mirrors of our right angle Michelson interferometers are sort of like these clocks. And we did the separate arms are clocks. And there's a quadrupolar distortion of mm -hmm. time with that magnitude. And um, and we and if it did, we would have seen it um, because we were sensitive to quadrupolar distortions of that kind. But we didn't see it, so we ruled that out. Now, there's this, another idea is that the, it, it's not as simple as that because actually the I mean even in this in this it's kind of interesting that the, most of the clock distortion is coming from a it's not a displacement but a velocity so it's an observer dependent displaced distortion mm -hmm. so there's maybe there's maybe the uh, we thought well maybe it's a transverse effect maybe there's a directional a component it's transverse it's a rotational component. And so the second experiment was designed to look, which would have been invisible in the first one. So, mm -hmm. so in effect, that would only be of the same magnitude but visible from the sides and the transverse part of the arm. And we also didn't see that. So, so that's that's a kind of is a way of saying that is that we didn't see it because there's a symmetry in the quantum gravity, which is why we didn't see it. I, but but of course, um, another way, another possible reason we didn't see it is that there's just there is no detectable effect, but there's, but it's, it's quite subtle because the thing we were measuring also, if you think about it, was a, it was a cross correlation between SU2 signals um, at, in, at, you know, it, with almost the same proper time at two different beam splitters. So there's, there are other scales on the apparatus. There's a separation between the beam splitters, for example. Mm -hmm. So we don't really know. I mean, I think you, 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 you have a, one thing that I learned by looking, thinking at the, at the cosmological problem is that the, the correlations could be really, uh, really very subtle indeed. I mean, the, well, maybe I should show that, that plot. This angular correlation corresponds to a power spectrum, which is the data is a very small quadrupole. It's orders of magnitude smaller than you would have expected from a naive scaling. Mm -hmm. 
and, and so maybe that's the reason we didn't see it in the first experiment. Maybe it was just a symmetry. It's not vanishing, but it's just really small. And you just have to look at higher order multipoles to see the effect. That's also possible. And that, that seems to be the, in the, in the Verlin and Zurich model, that might be the explanation. There might be an effect, but it's just too small for, we just didn't have enough sensitivity, even though it was plain sensitivity, it just wasn't quite there yet. So, so can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. So, so, is, so is there a way of sort of trying to detect the candidate that are used on this slide can those be detected sort of with interferometric experiments? I mean, that's what you would want, wouldn't you, right? To sort of that's right. And well, I think Hartmut's program would get us here eventually. Okay. I mean, you, you have to, right. I mean, yeah. So I, and I think the program is solid. I mean, especially if the cosmology holds this result up, we've got to do these experiments, figure it out. I, I'm not sure this is the right, I, you, I wouldn't just use this as a model for the time domain, you know, the angular correlation of our met, of our signal. I wouldn't do that because it's a cosmological system. It's overlapping horizons. It's not the same as an experimental apparatus, but it does show you that the overlapping horizons are, it's, a, it's the entanglement is subtle. If you have an emergent system of entangled um, nested causal diamonds, the, well, and I understand that it is subtle, but I'm just, maybe I don't know enough, but I'm sort of worried about the old Aristotelian epicycle problem that are we sort of adding more and more bells and whistles? Oh, well, that's true. And, and, and so um, I would only take this seriously. Well, I think there are ways to take it seriously. I mean, so the, the first thing would be, well, the, the simplest example is what we already did uh, on this one. It's just a symmetry. There's no epicycles. It's a, it's a number, a special number zero, special angle ninety degrees. Mm -hmm. So that's not epicycles. That's a symmetry. And if, yeah, if you no, can find end. right, and so if you could find similar, if you could, if you have a theory which guides you towards the right symmetries, okay, uh, that's you could, then you avoid epicycles, and 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 the and, and then of course if you can if you can measure the measurement in three dimensions, then it's even better because then you have many separate measurements, many separate systems where, I mean, th these, uh, you know, in the standard picture, this is just a miraculous fluke. And if you see yeah, that yeah, over yeah. and over again, yeah. it's gotta be a symmetry, right? Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, thank you very much. So I, I have a question, Mike. So um, yes, yeah, it's, it's very nice that all the roads are leading towards Rome, so it means that we need some quantum gravity. But would you say that in cosmology, is there a razor sharp argument that yes, if I see some effect, gravity is quantum. Can we say something? Can we pin it down to this extent? Well, no. I mean, in cosmology, it's all statistics, isn't it? And so it, it relies a lot on priors. There's a very strong prior that we, the model's right. The model we have works so well. Now, and on the other hand, I think that's, it's a misguided, that's a misguided prejudice because the thing that works really well is a very simple thing, which is a nearly scale invariant power spectrum, which is not specific to the quantum model. That's a property of the classical limit of the system. So in other words, I'm saying you have all the success of the standard model. The only reason to believe the standard quantum model of inflation is that, is if you really like, if you really think linearized field quantum gravity is the right model of quantum gravity, then yeah, that's the right model. But I, why would we believe that? I mean, there's a huge, all, all these other reasons are telling us not to believe that, everything from the black hole side and all that stuff. So, so no, I, I, I think, and, but that's, that quantum model of cosmology goes back to the early 1980s and it has, hasn't changed since. No reason to change it except for this, the large angle stuff. And so, um, no, I, so I, I, that's why I think it's most, that's why I'm, what I'm working on now is to, as well as we can get something which is a, a smoking gun of a symmetry that's very hard to ignore, that would uh, persuade us that we really should. I mean, I, I mean, I guess the other thing to say is that there's, um, 
this standard picture of quantum inflation, the one on the left, it's not all that beautiful. I mean, really, I mean, you, you, I mean, and there's been a lot of criticism of this ever since the beginning of inflation. I mean, Penrose, it's beautiful papers, and many of the papers sense about the, like the early stages of inflation, the prehistory of this, has all kinds of paradoxes, like the black hole information paradox. It, and it, trying to trace it back in time, it, it, like multiverse business and all that. Um, it's not that great, actually, and, and, it's, and, and the reason is that you really rely on an unexplained coherence going all the way to infinity of these modes, which you just put in by hand. That's the vacuum state you start with. So it's kind of a cheat, you know, you, you kind of start with a classical system, then you put in modes which are based on that. I mean, that is kind of, it's not causal. I mean, if, if you want to do something which is causal in the way that it should be to be consistent with you know the above you should do something more like the thing on the right so that you don't collapse mm -hmm. but it's really weird because here we are we're looking back at our horizon that sphere that's the microwave background map is on this sphere here um it's like everything else we're outside of that that's still quantum i mean it, you know the different different observers everybody at the end of the day will agree about observables that's how quantum mechanics works on the other hand not every the different observers won't agree about what part of their difference of perturbations is a perturbation and what part is in the background but that's because it's it's a maximally symmetric system the reason why the correlations are so small and large scales is that there's an exact symmetry that the on this largest scale, all the causal diamonds have exactly zero monopole perturbation. It's starting, it's starting from a maximally symmetric quantum gravity. I, again, I this is nobody knows how to make mm -hmm. quantum gravity coherent that way. The, the, it's not wired. It, the, the closest thing to it would be the anti de Sitter space. The problem with that is we don't live in anti de Sitter space. And anti de Sitter space is coherent. You, you have a quantum system on the horizon and it's dual to the bulk. That's great. On the other hand, it's a finite causal diamond and it's a fixed horizon. I mean, we can't map that on to either the cosmology or the experimental systems. It's kind of is exactly complementary to it. So I, I don't know how to. Yeah, I'm not, do, I'm not working on that kind of theory. That's so you guys, please do that. We need, we need theory of that kind. No, what I meant was that many of these uh, things are, I mean, you can, one can explain it perhaps from purely classical physics as well. So then the question remains that if someone is really agnostic, then how would I really discriminate? Well, I mean, so these two models agree, they have the same classical model. It's exactly the same classic inflation background. The only difference is the quantum coherence of the perturbations. It's the correlations that, and that's the only difference between them. And everything that happens after inflation, actually everything that happens outside the horizon, that's just, that is just classical standard cosmology. So I, it's only the quantum system that I've been tinkering with here. Thanks. Comment. Um, uh, at the very beginning, you you showed the um, black holes and the gravitational waves. Uh, I think at present, uh, with all the discussion about uh, ambiguities of uh, of uh, coherence in cosmological signal, the only way that we may be able to um, to see a sort of a quantum gravity effect is with gravitational wave, waves. And um, I'm not sure that anything else can be really comparable with, uh, with gravitational waves at present with, with our present technology. Well, okay, so I would say that gravitational waves, they're like radio waves. They're very coherent, right? They're generated by macroscopic, you know, like black hole binaries. So the quantum effects in those waves 
are really small. And um, th so the things I've been talking about, those are really small effects. You would not be able to see such small effects in say a LIGO detected waveform. Uh, on the cosmology signal, we measure that. I mean, and the reason why I'm optimistic about seeing the quantum gravity here is that inflation is not that far below the Planck scale. That's why we think we are measuring quantum, we are measuring metric perturbations from quantum effects in cosmology. That's, that's agreed upon. So the question is about whether the, what the correlations come from. Well, you know, it's in, practical, in the, it, sorry? It's practically impossible to, uh, as is, it was discussed, uh, it is very difficult to explain, uh, uh, to distinguish between uh, the fluctuations, which are statistical fluctuations, and the fluctuations, which are quantum fluctuations. This is very, very difficult. Even if you, if you see the correlations, correlations can be from quantum effects of matter, not gravity. Okay, so yeah, for in cosmology, um, this goes back a long way in cosmology, right? So for a long time, people thought, like what you're saying, maybe all the cosmic perturbations are just classical noise, just statistical fluctuations. Um, and then, but then the reason that everybody is, you know, since 1980s, believes this quantum origin is the right one is, is because of what is the horizon problem that, you know, it's the spectrum, really, the fact that you get such, you get um, the, the spectrum of a causally local fluctuation wouldn't have correlations in such large angular scales. Uh, that really has to be done back here. So, and, and what, and what is the word for that? I mean, that's, well, I guess the problem is we have too many models now. We have at least these two models from the quantum system to I mean, as, as you to said, make happen. For the time, at, at present, only modes which are outside uh, our horizon are really can be um, quantic. Yeah. Uh, everything which is inside, they are declared. Therefore, and we don't have really that much access to everything which is outside our, uh, uh, of our horizon. Present horizon. Inside, inside the horizon. Yeah, we don't, right. Yeah. We don't see anything this inside is, the horizon. This is the, yep. this is the whole problem. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, we do see what comes out, right? So, no, I, I don't think we can see, we will not be able to measure the quantum effects on macroscopic astrophysical, you know, solar mass, stellar mass black holes. They're just too small. I mean, there's just no measurement we can do. So, well, you've either got to do a, you've got an autonomous measurement. You know, in the laboratory, if there are fluctuations in a nearly flat space, that's one way. Another way is the cosmology system. If the cosmological constant is this QCD effect, then that's also, I don't think that's also unmeasurable, but well, the thing, what you can't measure is the fluctuations. I mean, you'd love to measure the QCD time scale gravity, but I don't think that's going to be measurable. What we measure is the the mean square effect over a long period, which is the cosmological constant. And, and the way to the way to test that is to measure the number. I mean, so so the, the analog there would be, you know, we can um, what one of the beautiful tests of uh, quantum electrodynamics is that we can measure uh, anomalous magnetic moments to amazing precision, and the theory agrees really well. That's what we might be able to do with the cosmological constant. You can do a, me a measure the value and compare that with a quantum gravitational prediction with a standard model perturbations and make it agree really well. And then you would say, yeah, we measure this many digits of precision, so we start to believe our theory. Thanks. So, so I, I have a very rela related uh, question. So it's almost the same a continuation of the same question in, in, in some way. So um, uh, also because I have not really followed this literature for a while. So when people try to detect, uh, you know, correlations in the microwave background. Okay, so I have two questions related to so it to, to find a really quantum correlation. You would need at least, uh, you know, two complementary bases. Right, not just a position intensity correlation, and not only that. If there are, of course, multi multi 
it is very scrambled and you have to observe you know at multi points as well in multi basis that's one question the other is that is gravity when when you're observing the cmb and i really don't know here the, is is the gravity traced out or are you observing the gravity plus matter joint system because if any of them is traced out you will again you know decohere the system yeah yeah no, okay so those questions are really getting into the i did not talk about the details of the cosmology mm -hmm. the first part of your question that is really subtle i mean and yeah that's that's the whole key that somehow or other all these different observers they all have to be equivalent and they're all the horizon they, they the spherical horizons around each observer all of them have zero offset from that observer that's the design but um but if you take circles on those spheres they don't have zero mean offset and the intersections between the horizon that's on that's on circles so when we measure the correlation what we're measuring is the the mean over the sky of the product of a polar value with the inter, with the circle of a certain angular separation so so the, somehow I mean, the, the the function that you see should have a it reflects all of that, all of these horizons coming. And, and it does, that's why you get exactly zero at 90 degrees, but away from 90 degrees. Well, at small angular scales, it's almost standard because then the, the, the very small spheres are like independent patches. So um, what's the best plot for this? Yeah, so in this, this part of the plot, that's pretty easy to predict. It's almost like a planar approximation. The sphericity of the horizon doesn't matter. And actually, it agrees, it agrees pretty well with the data. Actually, better than the standard model. So that is already pretty good. So, um, no, and, um, yeah, so this, and this, what was the second, what was the second part of your question already? I forgot. You know, it's, it's whether, whether the gravity, when, well, this I just don't know the answer to. So, so even yeah. to measure CMB is, is, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Trace yeah, out it. Or, um, is it yeah, no, right. So, so the issue there is um, at angular scales larger than five degrees, actually larger than about two degrees, the map of the sky, this image, is just the gravitational potential to high precision. It's just the sachs wolf effect. It's just like the clock delay. It's just the depth of the potential well, mod modified by, anyway, it's the sachs wolf effect. Um, and so the pattern you measure is, that's intact. Now, as you go to smaller angular scales, it gets all messed up because you have baryon transport, you have Doppler effects. And actually, that's the main effect in, in this, in this action, right? All of that, the intact stuff is that these low L's, but then at, at high L, all this structure is mainly from post recombination acoustic effects combined with the Sachs Wolf effect and dominate, it's dominated by the other effect. Yeah, so, so, um, no, and, and so actually at the moment, I think in, in all the high L stuff, it's best just to use the standard model. But, if it's a holographic picture, right? I mean, nobody knows. I mean, if, if you have an exact symmetry, if you have an exact two-dimensional correlation function and power spectrum, that's fine. But there is a three-dimensional projection of that in holography. I don't know how that works, but there is one, and, you know, in the third dimension. When you add up all this stuff, it has to, it, holographically, it adds, if holography is a real thing, then the three-dimensional space-time emerges from that somehow. And, and I think nobody knows how that works. So, you no, know, the three-dimensional issue is pretty subtle. That, but if, if, for example, if you're measuring three-dimensional effect, in the, in the, in the, if you do a measurement like this, you measure the galaxies. And in principle, you would be able to measure that. But there, I mean, there the problem is that the, the three-dimensional effects are messed up by nonlinear evolution and motions. So if that becomes an imperfect measurement for a different reason. But if, you know, on large scales, the quadrupoles are more or less intact. The motions are small. Displacements are small compared to the total effect. So that's why I still think this is something you might, you should look into it. You might be able to do a measurement. 
I think the questions, I think both the questions were very related and maybe my, so the question remains that how would you create a witness which could say that it's really quantum? Yeah, well, so yeah, there is, the there is no, right. The inflation system is no witness because it's just the one, right? I mean, it's the, it's about the beginning of space and time, right? It's, it's the boundary condition of everything. It, you, you do have many different realizations. If you do the three dimensional thing, you can look at different spheres. So you, you did do the experiment many times. So that's not quite the same as a witness. Um, the, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, uh, yeah, at some level, you're going to have to build out from a, the theorists are going to have to tell us how, you know, what to start with. There's, you know, the, you, you know, how to, you know what the limiting cases are. You have to build in from that. Thanks. So do we have other questions for Craig? If not, then we formally uh, close the meeting. And thanks a lot, Craig. It was a fantastic. Yeah, talk. thank you. I enjoyed this a lot. Very, it's really uh, fun. And good, good luck with your projects and your programs. It sounds great. But uh, if you want to, uh, you know, stay with us for a few minutes, we can. Uh, if it's not too much, uh, too late for you. I, I have. I have to run to another thing. Oh, that's, I see. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Thank thanks. Bye. Bye.